Calling all Portlanders and anyone willing to travel, Murder in the Rain has a live show scheduled for June 24th. Join us for a night of true crime in Portland's beautiful Revolution Hall. Tickets are on sale now at revolutionhall.com or at murderintherain.com. We hope to see you there. This is Murder in the Rain, where each week Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough tell true crime stories of the Pacific Northwest. Murder in the Rain contains graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. The month of May is full of reminders of the feminine energy surrounding us. Mother Earth shares her beauty with rays of sunshine and blossoming flowers. Mother's Day falls on the second Sunday of the month. And the woman I spoke with for today's episode is reminded of the most gutting pain a mother can experience, the loss of a child. To honor her child and his unsolved death, I will be sharing the case of Sir Charles Jones, a mother's child who can no longer tell his own story, so she did. Last year, while putting together scripts for our True Crime Tuesday segments at COIN, I came across articles about 22-year-old Sir Charles Jones. Sadly, the one minute of coverage I was able to give his story was pretty much all of the information that was and remains available. I don't usually contact the families I cover for True Crime Tuesday. Being such little coverage, it doesn't seem worth the risk of triggering them. However, I send the link if there's a Facebook group or a page for the victim. I want them to be able to share the information without the exhausting effort of retelling the story. After Sir Charles' story aired, his mother Jasmine reached out to us. She had seen the segment and wanted to talk more about Sir Charles, and I was more than happy to oblige. So often, as it is in this case, a story may catch our attention, but we aren't able to do an entire episode on it because the information available amounts to just a couple of sentences. And that was the case for Sir Charles. The information that has been released amounts to a time, location, and cause of death. But we know that the more attention we can bring to a case, the more likely it could inspire someone with information to report a tip. While there remains little information to be shared about Sir Charles' death, there is much to say about his life. Like so many mothers in this city, Jasmine has been left devastated by the loss of her son. Without answers as to who took his life, the echoes of pain rattle her daily. Jasmine and I spoke over Zoom a few weeks ago. She was gracious enough to not only share her time, but share her emotions and stories of her son's life with us. Please do be patient. There are a couple of moments with connection issues, but we've all been living with Zoom long enough now that we're able to handle it. Also, this is an emotional interview. It's a mother recalling the life of her son that was taken too soon. So, no, you didn't lose connection. There are just some emotional pauses. Sir Charles Mark Anthony Jones was born prematurely in 2000. It had been a miracle he made it past his first few hours of life as he was so small and the doctors weren't sure he would survive. But he did and was a loved addition to the family. Growing up, he was close to his five siblings and his mother, Jasmine. As we began, I asked Jasmine about Sir Charles, what he was like as a child, what he became as a young adult, and what he hoped for in the future. As far as Sir Charles goes, there's a lot to say about him. (laughs) A lot of people think I got his name from the basketball player, Sir Charles Barkley, and I didn't. I wasn't even thinking about him. I was actually thinking of Uh, Princess Diana's ex-husband, Sir Charles, of royalty. And he asked me when he was little, he said, why'd you name me Sir Charles? I said, because people are going to respect your name one day. I had Sir Charles. He was born at 26 weeks. He was born premature. Did he have to stay in the hospital? He did for about six months in the IC, the NICU, neonatal intensive care unit. For about six months, he was two pounds, which is interesting to me. I pay attention to numbers. He, when he was born, he was two pounds, two ounces. They actually gave him four hours to live, but he lived 20, 
22 years and he passed in the year 2022. He was very funny, very charming. His eyes, so pretty. I don't know if she meant to sound that cool by referring to the now king of England as Princess Diana's ex-husband, but I fully support the dismissal of that man. After his rough start to life, or perhaps the symbolic start of being a fighter, Sir Charles grew into a strong and healthy young man. His beautiful eyes and charming smile had me thinking at first glance, when I looked through the precious photos his mother sent me, that he must have been a bit of a troublemaker for his mom as he got into those teenage years, but the good kind of trouble, where that million-dollar smile can open the door to making friends, quelling arguments, or flat-out charming people. You know, that kind of trouble. He caused he caused me some. But he was so charming. His eyes never never seen anyone's eyes so beautiful. They were like if you take if you ever take a honey and you hold it up to the sun, that color that's that that, that was the color of his eyes. His eyes they had like they're kind of like an asterisk sign, like a star. I thought his eyes were so beautiful. He had really, really thick, long eyelashes. When he passed, when I got to see him at the viewing, I asked, him, you guys put fake eyelashes on him? Because it looked like he had, it looked, you know, those girls wear those big, long, fake eyelashes. It looked like that's what he had on, but they were his. They were his. But he was charming. He was rambunctious. He, when he was little, he was, he was trying, um, but he was so cute. And it was hard to stay mad at him for too long. He wasn't necessarily a bad kid. He was, you know, curious, smart, good with his hands. At the age of two, he uh, started taking, like, my old tape recorders apart, uh, TVs apart, and he would put them back together the right way. I know he was working in security. Was he kind of leaning towards that as a career or was that just kind of a placeholder he actually um he wanted to uh, become a police officer that's what he wanted to do i wasn't too fond of the work i mean i've never taken you know to be honest you know too much of like and to security guards or police officers it's just not nothing against them but it's just i never thought of that as a career but if that's what my son wanted to do then I would support that. I mean, I had to respect it. If that's what he wanted to do, I had to, you know, support him in doing that. So that's what he had planned to do. And he was actually just getting some overtime that night. So he wasn't even supposed to be there. Sir Charles' desire and drive to become a police officer ran in his blood. Back when it still existed, Jasmine's father was the security guard for the Walnut Park Fred Meyer in North Portland. Sir Charles's grandfather was also close friends with locally famous Officer Harry Jackson. Lieutenant Harry Jackson was well known in the PPB for not only his appearances on cops, but for his support of the local community. While he has since retired after 35 years of service, he felt the best way to be an officer was to be part of the community to walk with those he was to protect as they protested, to protect their rights to march, to be transparent about what the job entailed, and to support the people he was interacting with. In 2011, he was delighted to place a badge on his newly sworn-in son, Jackery, who is now a member of PPB. Sir Charles followed that deep desire towards being an officer. He felt that one of the first steps towards making that dream come true would be to start out as a security officer. Then came the earliest hours of May 6, 2022. While in his personal vehicle, which he used for work, Sir Charles sat parked outside the South Waterfront Marriott Hotel. Perhaps he was looking out at the Willamette River, enjoying the sights. Maybe he was keeping a vigilant eye on the property he had been hired to protect, not detecting the danger that was coming toward him from the shadows. It was about 3.20 a.m. when police were called after the sounds of gunfire rattled the quiet morning. Police arrived at the scene, they found other bullet holes in two other vehicles, and they found Sir Charles, who was already gone. There were no witnesses, no suspects. Sir Charles would be the 38th homicide in Portland of 2022, out of what would eventually total a record-breaking 101. 
Sir Charles would be one of the 17 black men under the age of 30 who would be shot and killed that year. His death would also fall into the 45% of homicide cases from then that do not have an arrest or lead. This was Jasmine's retelling of that darkest of days. Um, first, we didn't we didn't know we we we, we didn't we weren't for sure. Um, when I when I did find out, of course, I went I went down there um, to the scene, and I'm I'm gonna choose to not say what I saw. I mean, you know, you guys you guys did a story on it. You know, it was dark and it was raining. And by the time I got there, of course, it was daylight. No, oh, I don't think it's 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 you know May sixth. It'll be a year, and I don't think it's I don't I don't think it's I don't I don't think it's sunk in just yet. So, but there's some things that I can talk about and some things that I can't. It is still open investigation. We do still need tips. I can't, I can't even remember the first three days after I found out, after I, I left the scene down there. After that, I, don't, I have absolutely no clue what happened after that. When it comes to details and information available, there isn't much that is known. And of what is, it can't all be shared since there is still an active investigation. As Jasmine says, whatever tips can be called in are pieces of the same puzzle— A tip worthy of calling in doesn't have to be the name or description of the shooter. It could be a car that was in the area or conversations that have been overheard. It can be anything, because at some point it might be that one little piece that fits with another and solves the case. Yeah, because it's an open investigation. And it's, I can, it's like I want, well, it's like any any piece, big or small, is going to help. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's going to you might not need it at that time, but it might fit, you know. Yeah. It might fit at a later time and, and make sense then, you know what I mean? You open up a box of puzzles, uh, you know, the puzzle pieces, you don't automatically just pick the right pieces and it comes together. You got to study it, figure it, step back, and take a look at the big picture, you know, yeah. take a break, <laughs> come back to it. Yeah. Might take several tries, might take days, weeks, months years, who knows? But that puzzle, all those pieces go together. So often we hear from friends and family members of victims that the detectives managing the case are either uninvolved, always changing, or causing more harm than good. So I asked Jasmine if she, at the very least, had a supportive relationship with the detectives handling Sir Charles's case. And there are quite a few of them. Um, I've got, I've actually got a middle person for that okay because it's a lot calling every day every week that gets exhausting for both yeah. parties it does it's exhausting so she's right engaging with detectives is exhausting so it's a good idea to ask a family member to take over those duties recently i've been working more and more directly with people related to or involved in cases They are always surprised at the lack of follow-up from the police or how much work they have to do just to get answers regarding their loved one. They say the system is broken, but it seems like it's working exactly as intended. If you're a single mother and working like most have to, more than one job just to keep food on the table and a roof over your head, when exactly would you have the time to be calling detectives or doing your own investigation? In that scenario, you certainly wouldn't have the resources for a private investigator or a lawyer— Combine that with the difficulties brought on by being a person of color and the so often tense relationship between yourself and the police and the lack of pressure can allow police to focus on cases that they find more important or solvable. The inability to adequately investigate cases can come from a variety of issues. In Portland, for example, there are staffing issues in the police department, not due to a lack of budget, but more often a lack of interest in the job. We also already have, in 2023, over 20 shooting deaths to investigate with very little to go on. But the lack of closed cases can't always be blamed on staffing. Like in Aaron Christensen's case, which I will be doing a follow-up episode on in the near future, the cops screwed it up and so they want it quiet. 
Lewis County would love nothing more than for everyone to shut up about Aaron and Buzz. That's not due to the case not having leads or that they don't want to catch a killer, although that might be why, but because the attention asking for answers only draws more eyes to their investigation that was so mishandled. So for someone like Jasmine, who, even if she had nothing else going on in her life but to focus on her son's case, she is constantly consumed by the grief and pain of losing a child. So it seems unreasonable to also ask her to continually call the police and beg them for answers and updates. Why should she have to be the one to keep her son's name in the media in an attempt to draw that critical attention? It's unfair. It's um, I never would have thought. And I mean, I'm, I'm born and raised Portland. I'm 42 years old. I've been burying people since I was eight years old. I've buried over 40 friends. Never would have thought, you know. I, and that was the reason I stopped going to funerals because I, I was so tired of hearing that, that mother's cry. You know what I mean? It just that mother, that hearing that, that mother's cry. Mm-mm. I never, I never would have thought it would be me, but. Hearing a mother who has lost her own child talk about avoiding the funerals for the far too many people she had lost in her life because of the mother's cry makes me ill and have goosebumps at the same time. I've only heard that mother's cry once at a funeral for her daughter. And if you've heard it, you know what Jasmine means. That noise stays with you. It somehow punches you in the throat, heart and stomach simultaneously. It's a sound that we all know exists deep within us at our most animalistic center And it's a sound that no one should ever have to hear, let alone express. Though her son is gone from this world, Jasmine is still connected to Sir Charles. How could she not be? After all, they would spend hours together just laughing and talking. It's good I have Kleenex over here. Oh. (laughs) I can say that my son in the physical realm, he's he's no longer here. Spiritually, I feel he's here because I still feel him. I still talk to him. He still tells me, I mean, a hundred times a day, he loves me just like he, just like he did when he was here. So I still have that, that, that spiritual connection with him. That's not going to go anywhere. Have either of you ever heard that? Heard a mom? I have The mother's cry now. I yeah. haven't, but I, I feel like I, I know what. Oh yeah. I know yeah. what that would be like. Yeah. I, I literally, like, I can stop, and if I open that thought, I can hear it. I've only heard it one time, and it, like, you hear it on on TV and movies and whatever, and it's nothing like hearing it from the person. I know two people who have lost a child, and they both kept it together because they had other kids Mm -hmm. that they were being strong for, but yeah, I can imagine just from, like, seeing life go on after yeah, how they wanted to, you know? Mm -hmm. Sir Charles's death had a ripple effect, and not just within his own family. I do know people that they've had either spouses or their children or a family member that were security guards. And since my son's murder, they've quit, gotten different, different jobs. The only thing I can think to pull out of this is to change is to change something for these security guards, change some type of rules, something. You know what I mean? I didn't have an interest in this field, you know, until my son got into it. So what a way to keep him alive, figure out some type of a way. When people heard about what happened to Sir Charles, there was a lot of jumping to conclusions. First off, he wasn't supposed to. That's, that wasn't, he didn't just work at one site. He worked at many sites. So that's not just his normal place. When people hear about my son's case, the first thing they they say is, oh, was he a gang member? Or uh, was he selling drugs? Or was he doing in the car late at night? He was was on the clock. He was in his uniform uh, with his badge on where he was supposed to be. And he got killed. That was people talking to her being like, oh, was he, you know, involved in stuff? Uh, Did he, you know, basically, yeah, did he have it coming kind of of a thing? He's probably like on a lunch break in his car, right? Like, no, he was he was actively just working. Yeah. So the job was basically like to be at that space. I see. uh, Monitoring the Marriott. So 
Yeah, but I and I think I mean we've talked about this so many times how people want it to be a reason Explainable. because then it's why it happened to that person, not just then, some scary out of nowhere situation. Yeah, then it can't happen to me just sitting in my car. Well, and that person likely had been. Uh, I mean, if I had to jump to conclusions, stalking the area mm. and understanding the comings and goings mm-hmm. of the people in that area. Yeah. So they may have planned it. Yeah. Did I don't know if you said this. Did they did anyone hear the shots? Yeah, that was the police were called. And okay. I would guess because even though it was three in the morning, it was still right at the Marriott. So you've got, you know, front desk people. I don't know mm-hmm. who called police, but you've got front desk people. So it's 24 hour, right? Mm-hmm. And you've got people in the hotel. So if someone had their room right there, they would have heard it. It's so. on the on the waterfront. On the yeah, south it's waterfront. a very oh, yeah. big yeah. hotel. And honestly, that area at night is truly desolate. Yeah. There's no one on the street. It's so quiet for being downtown. Yeah, it's like, well, it's also kind of like separated from the regular mm-hmm. downtown. It's like its own little Further thing. than the bar. Yeah. yeah. Not wanting her son's death to be in vain, Jasmine is hopeful she'll find an outlet to correct the many issues she feels surrounds those who work for security companies. Perhaps if she can find a way to make the job safer for those in the field, it will honor Sir Charles's memory and his life, and maybe his death will have served a purpose. The term security guard is incredibly broad. It encompasses the guy who checks your bags at Ross, the guard who walks a property, an armed guard at a high-security facility— In trying to find the exact numbers pertaining to how dangerous being a security guard can be, I found security guard numbers paired with police officers, homeland security, and correctional officers. And that's exactly Jasmine's point. My brother worked in security downtown overnight for years. He had a bike and a badge, but that was about it. While he dealt with the same population as the police, which can be dangerous and unpredictable, he was never met with the same respect from either the police or the citizens. Far too often, security officers are the butt of a joke. They're the rent-a-cop, the Paul Blarts. But that limbo can leave security officers in a precarious position of power and lack thereof. It's unreasonable to ask personnel to keep your property and businesses safe while you aren't keeping them safe. Sir Charles, though, he knew what he needed to do to keep himself as safe as possible. Driven by his desire to become a police officer, he took it upon himself to take training courses and to buy his own PPE or personal protection equipment. My thing is, so he was in a personal vehicle. If they're going to be allowed to to go to work, use their own personal vehicles, there has to be some kind of decal or something on their car that says that they're security. You know, maybe something they can stick on it, a magnet and pull off or something. I don't know. Who knows that if he would have had that on, on the car he was sitting in, had they not done that, if they would have seen security on duty or whatever it may be. Something's got to, something's got to change. They got, I just, I see that there's a whole lot of flaws. There's a whole lot of flaws in the security field. I see a lot of elderly people. I keep looking away. I'm I'm looking at my son's picture. I've got a life cycle for him up there. And he's just smiling and it's kind of like he's here. It's kind of like it's us we talking. But I see, you know, like elderly people, they look like they're too I don't and I don't mean I don't mean it in a in a disrespectful way, but I mean, come on, honestly. Like it's gotta be a cutoff age. Yeah, and then they say they can't put their their hands on them if they're still in or if they're and then you let the public know that and well do 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 look what happens you know what I mean <laughs> left and right and it's like and then you know you want to put for instance his his job they wanted to keep putting him because um, he was armed he was licensed and all that he all everything he he was legit that he was supposed to be he was that he brought he bought his own PPE. Um, they didn't. They didn't provide any of that for him. I, I just. I understand that. I understand that they yeah. and barely. He and he went through his own training. He would he bought extra training. He would go to the shooting range. They didn't prepare him for. He prepared himself. And still, you know, they wanted to put him in on on working on working at sites. Uh, unarmed where he needed to be armed. It didn't make any sense. Was he armed that night? Mm-hmm. His, his job never reached out to me. 
Marriott never reached out to me, didn't even send flowers. He well, the, he worked for Cascadia Global Security. That's who he worked for. You know, say today he might be at New Seasons, and then tomorrow he might be at like U.S. Bank. Then the next day he might be, you know, somewhere else. He would just go to different places. Now he had been at the Marriott before. Somebody asked him to take that shift that night. So Marriott was third party. Cascadia Global, they sent some flowers. After hearing that the Marriott did not reach out to Jasmine with their condolences or even acknowledgement of the loss of her son while patrolling their property, I was shocked. Are you kidding? So they were third party. So the security company he worked with was hired or contracted through the Marriott. So he wasn't technically a Marriott employee. Why wouldn't they, though? Are they afraid they're opening it up for a lawsuit or something? Like, do the nice How hard would that be to send flowers and in say we're so sorry that he died watching our property. That's that's really horrible. There's yeah. no empathy there. No. So I emailed their PR and media team asking if they now had a statement and why they never reached out to Jasmine. When I didn't hear back after the first emails to the three people, I wrote the team again. I never received any acknowledgement of Sir Charles or a single email, even in, like acknowledging that I was writing to them. So if someone from the downtown Portland Marriott or Marriott in general would like to contact us to share a statement regarding Sir Charles being killed while protecting their business, it would be much appreciated. You can reach us at murderintherain at gmail.com. But I was pretty surprised to not even get like Thank you for your email. At this time, we don't have a comment or something along those lines. Or because he was contracted, we can't comment. But they just didn't acknowledge it. Yeah, you'd think they'd have some sort of bucketed response that they would have to do. Yeah. That's really, really shady. Yeah. When it comes to what Jasmine wants to do with the energy she carries for her son now, she's asking for your help. This is something no one should ever have to experience, and she wants to make a change. So if you or someone you know works with a security company or a group or a union that helps security companies develop safer conditions, you can also email us at murderintherain at gmail.com, and we can get you in touch with Jasmine. I feel like there should have been somebody else there working with him. You know, they should have a buddy system or something. He shouldn't have been there by himself. So there has to be, you know, I don't know. How I don't know what something's gonna change. Something's gonna change. I'm gonna make sure of that. Definitely. You know, if you if you know anything or anybody that I can go to, write a letter to, or start a petition. I don't know, but I would hate to see this happen to somebody else's parent, child, spouse, because it's not. Whatever I do is going to be something positive. Something positive. As the year mark was just a few weeks away when we spoke, I asked Jasmine how she was approaching the milestone. Of course, she started by saying it wasn't going to be any kind of celebration. It was, however, the reason she reached out to us and other media outlets, just hoping her son's name would be set on the air so that the one person who knows what happened would see it and maybe call in a tip. She needs the help because as time has passed, as we see far too often, the public interest fades, the names fall from the headlines, and again, the family is left to carry the burden of solving their loved one's murder while being crushed by grief. Speaking with Jasmine was a real honor. Her energy was so positive, even though you can sense the weight of her heartbreak from afar. I commended her on her strength and told her how I think of people in her position all the time, be it while watching a movie about a kidnapping or watching the horrors of local news, the thought of having a child and losing it in a horrible manner, and on top of that, not knowing the full story or having the responsible party facing consequences— It makes me nauseous and unsteady, like when I try to imagine the size of space. It's a pain that seems unfathomable to bear. 
So to speak with Jasmine and to see her smile at and talk to her son while she continues to fight to bring him something resembling justice was awe-inspiring. What makes getting through the day even harder for Jasmine, and I'm sure countless other parents, is the questions and comparisons she faces while being drowned by the pain. I know, and it's hard to, and that's what I say, is like, people ask me, like, what does it feel like? And uh, I mean, I think I probably, like, maybe crawled out of the bed, to be honest with you, like, maybe two months ago. I've been in the bed since May last. I have. You know, like, you ever go swimming and you hold your breath? And you go down too far, and then you try to come back up, but it's taking too long, and you're trying to, you're still holding your breath, and you're trying to get back up to the top before you, it's like you feel like you're about to suffocate. It's like feeling like that, it's like a every inhale and every exhale, you feel like that makes sense. Like you're breathing, but you still feel like, but you got to keep going. You got to, you know, I mean, because it's tough out there. Everybody's going through something, you know. It might not be my something. People have compared, you'd be surprised, compared me losing my son to them losing their dog or losing their grandma 20 years ago. It's been a lot of things said to me, like, oh, toughen up and keep going, you know? Yeah, it's mean. <laughs> but it's like, dang, the world is really cruel. But I get it. Everybody's going through something. I'm just, you know, I'm just grateful my son's still, because my, my son's the one. He's like, no, mom, you got to get up. You got to brush your teeth, mom. You got to get up. And, no, come on. And it took months months and i kid you not i i don't even remember last summer i looked up and here i am today like i i don't have i, I honestly don't everybody's going through something you know i just this is this one here is uh yeah this is this is it's, you know, to have to have him, my my son's ashes here, and have his ashes up there, and have the clock set for three o'clock, because that's what time they say it happened. I never would have thought, never thought. Yes, you heard that correctly. People have said to this mother's face that losing their dog was as painful as her losing her son. As we spoke, she lifted up a necklace showing me where she held some of Sir Charles's ashes. Turning behind her, she had what looked to be a space of celebration for her son. A photo, a small clock she had set to three, his time of death, and another collection of ashes. Through all of it, Jasmine is finding herself driven, she has been dragged into the world of frustrated citizens who want a change. Not only does she want to make a change to honor her son, but if it keeps one family from having to experience the pain she's gone through, then it will be worth it. No mother should raise her son to be a hard worker, only to have his life taken while on the job. And it's, it's messed up that I'm, I'm, I'm finding purpose through my pain. It's like, if that's the case, to hell with the elderly security guards, to hell with anybody else's kids, to hell with what's going on in Portland, to hell with it. I don't, I don't have to care, but I do. Yeah. It's like, I don't really want to, but I do. I actually do. I would hate for anybody else to go do this on the job. And I always told my, my, always told my son, I always told my son, go to work, go to work. Go to work ever since he was 16. I, I've been working since I was 14. That's back when minimum wage was four dollars and twenty-five cents. That was my first job. You want this, you want that, go work for it. That's what he's always done. I mean, I'm proud of the mother that I am and that I was to him. It's like, dang, he went to work and you tell him to go anyway, and look what happens. 
As someone who has also grown up in the Portland area, Jasmine has seen and felt the changes we've all noticed, especially over the past few years. Back in the day, news of shootings seemed to involve people who perhaps landed in a situation where gunfire was more likely to happen, maybe as part of a drug deal or gang rivalry or a bank robber running from the cops. Of course, it goes without saying that no one is deserving of being involved in gunfire. It's just that it used to seem that if you weren't putting yourself in certain situations, you didn't have to worry about possibly being shot. But that has changed. With guns being more accessible than ever, it seems like every city is turning into a new Wild West. Just a few weeks ago here in Portland, two men got into an argument in the back room of an adult store, and one was shot and killed. Here, I'll have Jasmine further speak on this and how her son's death has changed how she feels in the city now. The point in time where it used to be color of your skin, that you wore, you know, where you lived, where you stood, who you were affiliated with. Now it don't matter. It could be a baby. It could be an older person, black, white. It does nobody's exempt anymore. And that's sad. So I am, I'm finding some purpose, some, some, some kind of a way. I'm going to try to get something, you know. I am born and raised. I'm 42 years old. I've lived in almost every neighborhood in, in Portland. I've lived outside of Portland. You know, I just, this is crazy. I've been to places that actually have ghettos. We don't have no ghettos here. Right. You know, <laughs> we, we got a good here. It's crazy. And I've never been afraid to walk down the street to, I've never especially with my son, to me, everybody's suspect. You don't trust anybody, really, especially yeah. not after something. Like this, you know, I'm hoping that this comes, that, you know, things come out because it's really. Um... It was at this point Jasmine brought up other cases involving security guards in the Portland area. She said there had been a rash of assaults and other attacks on officers in the months following Sir Charles's death, and she was right. Most recently, there was an incident on April 4th of this year. It was 11.15 a.m. when police responded to calls of a man throwing a rock at and breaking the window of a local business, a behavior so rampant, a recent study of restaurant owners in the city showed that 92% of Portland restaurants had experienced a break-in. 35% have had multiple break-ins, and 83% have experienced vandalism. The cost of these incidents and the lack of support from our feckless mayor have left 38% of those owners considering leaving the area. Good job, Ted Wheeler. You and your real estate cronies are doing a great job. The vandalism and break-ins have been blamed on Oregon's decriminalization of drugs, but that feels like a scapegoat. Sure, you can't arrest people for having small amounts of meth or heroin on them, but that wasn't working before anyway. Instead, the money that was used to prosecute and hold those people accountable was supposed to be going back into the system, providing addiction and mental health support. We've yet to see those outcomes. Okay, so back to the events in April. After being seen throwing the rock through the window on Southwest 10th and Taylor downtown, the culprit's photo was given to police. They didn't locate the man at the time, but they did get another call later in the day when he was seen at 5th and Oak. When police arrived, the man, 32-year-old David Everding, quote, took hold of the security guard monitoring the building and used him as a shield to avoid (sighs) being arrested. Now, it's unclear if David had any kind of weapon on him or if he was just kind of holding the officer in front of him. But either way, the officer was unharmed. Thankfully, the guard was able to get away and David was arrested and charged with second-degree kidnapping, escape, and first-degree criminal mischief. I was so worried you were going to say it as like a shield. Oh, gunfire oh yeah, no, no, just a human shield Jeez. like betwixt him and the yeah. police. But I think that's pretty cool that a kidnapping charge came from yeah, that. Yeah, that's good. Like, so often we're like, how is that not a higher charge? Mm-hmm. That's doing it right. Yeah. Right there. Someone who has put the vandal in vandalism is Johans Belt. He was arrested in November of 22 for threatening employees at a plaid pantry convenience store and for property destruction. With a bond of $250, he paid the $25 and was out. On December 6th, he was arrested again, just two weeks after the previous incident. 
On that occasion, he went into the Department of Human Services building in Portland, where he threatened to shoot the employees unless he was given an EBT, or Electronic Benefits Transfer, for those needing SNAP food benefits. As he left the building, he was stopped by the security guard, who was promptly assaulted. I was unable to find information about that guard, but it appears he was okay. Escaping that situation, Johans went into a nearby gift and toy shop called Stumptown Otaku. According to a witness that spoke with Coin News, quote, he came in and was speaking in a way that didn't make a lot of sense. He did threaten to kill us. He says he kills people. He comes over and starts taking the pens. I was like, that's fine. He starts taking the change. I was like, that's fine. And I said, take whatever you want. I just need you to leave. After that, I just kept repeating. That employee also held bear mace in her hand should Johans get any closer. Instead, he grabbed expensive items. When the store owner attempted to chase him out of the store, Johans grabbed a stick and chased him back, smashing said expensive items as he went. Johans, who is listed as being houseless, has been charged with no less than 65 misdemeanors in the last 20 years. Of course, he was convicted of 19, and of those 19, four were violent crimes. He has been on parole, which he has violated 25 times. It is important to remember that so often houseless folks do have long records because so much of how they live is illegal. Camping outside, open fires, urinating outside, and stealing food because you're hungry. So it's not that every houseless person is a career criminal, but their existence has been criminalized. A specialized team, the Strategic Prosecution Services Unit, will review Johans's history and try to find what might work for him. Clearly, he is unwell, so maybe jail will keep him from getting into trouble or affecting the community, but it won't help him or the community if he is released without some sort of treatment plan in place. Mm-hmm. When the police arrived, Johans used a slur and threatened to take and use the officer's gun before he was apprehended. We'll have to wait and see what his outcome is. Hopefully, he's given the help, tools, and resources he needs. Helping that one man will help to keep everyone else safe. In July of last year, just two months after Sir Charles's death, another officer was shot. The unnamed guard was working for Eclipse security professionals as he patrolled the neighborhood in North Portland surrounding Legacy Emanuel Hospital. It was around 4 a.m. that Sunday when he passed a vehicle in his patrol car. As he passed, someone stepped out of the car and opened fire on the guard. The person fired six shots. The patrol vehicle was struck several times. Thankfully, the officer was not hit, though he was injured by the shower of broken glass caused by the blown-out windows. Regarding the attack on his employee, Mark Mercer, owner of Eclipse Security Professionals, said, quote, I don't know if there was a reason for it because we don't know who the person is as of this time. I think we've all got concerns. There just seems to be a very callous and lawless attitude towards any kind of uniformed presence or any kind of authority. I think people need to be aware of their safety. I think they need to be aware of their environment. Just days before that shooting, on June 26th of last year, a guard was monitoring the property at 126th and East Division around 2 a.m. when he came upon a trespasser. Wearing his uniform, holstered gun, and a ballistic vest, he approached the man and gave him the order to leave the area. Instead, the man lunged for the guard. During that scuffle, the trespasser was able to get the gun out of the holster. As he fought for his life, the guard thought quickly and was able to release the magazine. Unfortunately, a bullet remained in the chamber. Mm. The trespasser turned the gun on the guard and shot him in the chest. Amazingly, even at that close range, the bulletproof vest not only saved the guard's life, but kept him from sustaining any kind of injury. Wow, how scary. Yeah, and s- such quick thinking to be like, yeah, I gotta to just, drop the magazine. I can't worry about getting the gun, I just have to get the bullets away. Yeah, that's that like smart. really smart. I wonder if that's part of their training or if that was just... I bet that's part of his training. Yeah. Like he's probably had to deal with some people uh, at work and probably taught himself like that's gonna be something I, I might need to do. In both the shooting of the vehicle and of the officer, there are no suspects, no information to share, nor has anyone been caught. If you have any information, you are asked to email crimetips at portlandoregon.gov. A year ago, just weeks before Sir Charles was shot, another guard's life was endangered right here in Troutdale. On April 12th, around 4 p.m., a 911 call was made saying that three people, armed with a gun, robbed a store at the Troutdale Outlets, or as us locals call them, the Troutlets. 
Attempting to stop the robbery, the gun was then held at the security guard who arrived on the scene. Thankfully, neither party fired. Instead, the robbers ran to their gold Mercedes and drove off. The hard-to-miss vehicle was spotted by police who then attempted to pull them over. The driver continued, swerving between lanes. Soon after, shots were fired at the police. One police car was struck, but they did not return fire. Spike strips were laid on I-84. They popped a tire but did not stop the car. The car then got off the freeway and went north towards the main thoroughfare of Sandy Boulevard and 162nd. There, they hit another car. That finally stopped them. Two of the suspects were caught and a third ran. That suspect was a white female wearing black pants and a gray hoodie. Thankfully, the other vehicle's driver was okay. I did not see anything saying that that third suspect was ever caught, so they might still be on the loose. On March 26th of 2022, a bicycle security guard was ordering a coffee at Ace's Barista in northwest Portland when, around 9.45 a.m., 51-year-old Samuel J. Cousage approached the officer from behind and, using the most bizarre makeshift weapon I've seen in a while, he stabbed him in the head. The weapon, photos of which we'll have on our blog, was two green-colored pencils shoved into a plastic bottle of Procure Bloody Tuna Oil. Now, that sounds made up, but I have looked into it, and I guess it's a bottle of chum, basically, that people use what as fishing bait. the hell? So the bottle itself doesn't look all that different from, like, an Elmer's glue bottle, except in this case it had pencils sticking out of it. Odd. Thankfully, because the guard was still wearing his bicycle helmet, the pencils only nicked his skin. He was taken to the hospital to be checked out and was quickly cleared. I'm not sure that there's any relation, but a Samuel John Wick Cousage III was arrested in 2017 for destroying property after Trump was elected. So perhaps they are related and they are a radicalized family against any kind of authority. And Sam Sr. saw an opportunity to take out someone he thought was an officer of the law. The owner of the cafe, Judah Alley, told KPTV, It was a really hard hit. I'm actually surprised he was able to run after him. I would have assumed it caused really bad head trauma. I ended up calling 911 because I didn't know if he had any backup or was able to flag down anyone else. I was on hold for about 10 minutes, but by then they told me they had officers at the scene. He, the officer, comes by to get coffee almost every day or just comes to check up on us and make sure all the baristas are okay. He came by to get his regular drink, and while he was checking out, a homeless individual that goes by Sam came up. He had a homemade weapon, and he just stabbed him in the back of the head, neck area. It was horrible. Sam was arrested and charged with assault in the second degree and unlawful use of a deadly weapon, to which he pled not guilty. This was just about a year ago, and once again, I didn't see anything about sentencing, so perhaps he hasn't even gone to trial yet. These are the cases of attacked security guards just in Portland, and only from the last year. Jasmine is right. Something needs to be done to protect these people who are just doing their job. They aren't the police who are maybe fumbling an investigation or giving you a ticket. They are hired to protect the people and property of their employer. I think this also warrants a conversation about property over people. There are many ways to take that statement. You know, indigenous people should have their land instead of a company buying it up and building something on it, or that police shouldn't find it reasonable to use lethal force because property is being damaged, or in Sir Charles's case. Of course, you need to have someone protect your business, but what is the cost we should ask people to give to protect a car dealership or an empty lot or a Marriott hotel? And if we're going to have the nerve to ask them to be prepared to give their life for that property, why are we not also providing them with as much protection and support as possible? Knowing just how dangerous the profession is, Jasmine makes an effort to engage with officers anywhere she goes. See, everywhere I go, I, I, my son knew a lot of Everywhere I go, uh, if I see security, I stop and I talk to them. I look at their, I see where they, where they work at, who they're employed by. I ask if you know, they don't mess up. Usually, yeah, ask spark up a, you know, a conversation. It's, it's so much. I've had my mind's been so much on my sons. It's just like, yeah, there was a spike in, in, in assaults with security guards. I just, and it's just weird to me that, I don't know, it's not taking me and taking more seriously. Hey, a robocop. I watched that movie the other day. You know, yeah, there's 
They're so disrespectful. And I, you know, I've even been places. I've seen a, I've seen a dude beat up a, a security guard because he wouldn't let him into the place without ID. And he just, I mean, banked him, banked him, banked him up against the window. And I'm just like, Lord, I'm going to go on in here and stay because I don't want him to be mad at me. I think he might have quit his job that day. Yeah. I would have. It was, it was, it was pretty tough. It was bad. I'm just like, and that was, and that actually, that was before my son even got killed. Don't mess around. They're going to activate martial law if people don't stop. And then we're really going to be in trouble. Mm. That war against them and we're going to be in trouble. Just that lack of respect for authority is just, yeah. Yeah. After learning of the attacks on officers, we then discussed what the cause could be. Is it people who are against police but come across a guard and see it as a less threatening but just as much of a statement to hurt them? Is it that security positions are going to have a higher rate of minorities than the police force, so it's someone wanting to hurt people of color? We both landed on the idea that it could be for both, many other, and even unknown reasons. Then we discussed the police budget. And I don't even think Portland, we didn't, we didn't vote to defund the police, no? No, I, I know there was, I, I want to say there was like a city council vote that did change some of the funding or they tried to manage the budget a little better. But, you know, they bought their second airplane a couple months ago. So I don't know that it's that restrained. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> My thoughts exactly. <laughs> Read your mind. Uh, yeah, <laughs> just, to, just to sit back at an arm cross. Uh-huh. As we wrapped up our conversation, we again talked about the pain everyone is carrying around daily, which is why we should try our best to be kind to everyone. She continued to share her idea for future plans that may help others. So I always say you never know what people go through. Oh, you never know. Just treat them with kindness. Yeah. Even if they're acting like that, though. Maybe her dog died this morning. That's why she's mad. They could be going through (laughs) something, too. I get it. I'm staying positive. I'm praying every day. So I'll I'll never get justice because, you know, he's not coming back. But uh, I can't stop fighting for him. And I just I really do want to put something in place to prevent this from happening, you know, again. You know, even 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 uh, I've even thought of, um, you know, making these making the security guards maybe once a month go through police camp training or something like that. You know, put yeah. you know, yeah. they, they needed more training. I remember when he got his um, when he went and bought his when it, the bulletproof vest, he really need all of that to be a security. He's like, yeah, mom, it's rough out there. And I remember when I, I don't know why I said it to him at the time. I said, but they don't they don't make bulletproof helmets. And and that's what he needed that. He needed he needed the helmet. My son was shot in the head. If you would like to support Jasmine, here are some ways you can do so. You can look for Justice for Sir Charles, that's the number four on Instagram and Facebook. And you can also go to GoFundMe and look for Murdered Security Guard Sir Charles Jones of PDX and donate to the family directly. More than anything, Jasmine would like you to call in your tips. You can always do so anonymously via crimestoppersoforegon.com. Here are some final words from Jasmine. Please, if you know anything about this case, do the right thing and bring this mother the smallest bit of relief. Call it in. We have too many mothers in this city in the same situation, just waiting for the day their child can rest in peace because their killer has faced justice. Please share this episode or Sir Charles's information or the GoFundMe on your social media. And another mother who faced a terrible anniversary in May is Kenya, T.T. Gully's mother. May 27th marked four years since T.T. was found hanging in a tree in Rocky Butte Park. Her death was ruled a suicide, but for anyone who knew T.T., they found that hard to believe. T.T. was optimistic and showed no signs of suicide. Of course, you can never say never, and anyone can become overwhelmed and end up taking their own life, but there are usually signs. Additionally, there were witnesses in the park that claimed to have seen T.T. being attacked, and there are rumors there's even a video of the event. T.T. was only 31 years old at the time of her death. 
Sadly, her family had recently moved to Portland from Kansas City as they were dealing with bigotry there, as T.T. was a young black member of the LGBTQIA2S plus community. Once they got to Portland, T.T. devoted her time to helping people who were in similar situations she had experienced in her own life, those struggling with housing retention and mental health issues. In these four years, her family has held vigils, marches, and have a Change.org petition out, which has over one million signatures, all in hopes to have the case looked at and reevaluated. You can sign the petition by visiting Change.org and searching for T.T. Gully. The loss of their loved one has taken a severe mental and physical toll on T.T.'s family. You can help them directly by supporting the GoFundMe page Family of T.T. Gully Needs Assistance, or by donating to her mother and sibling directly via their Cash App accounts, which are available on our Instagram page. If you have any information about what may have happened to T.T. Gully in Rocky Butte Park on May 27, 2019, you can anonymously contact Oregon Crime Stoppers at 503-823-4357. The sound of a mother's cry for a lost child is so painful and deep. It's a scream that echoes in the heavens and rattles the earth. Portland skies are filled with those wails of pain. Justice doesn't make those screams or the pain behind them go away, but if it can alleviate that pain, even just a little bit, then it's worth pursuing. Just want more leads, more tips. Um, anything helps. Hey, we all go through stuff. And once we know that and accept it, but we have to direct it where it's supposed to go. We'll, we'll get it together. Yep, I'm trying. I, I got two options. I can give up or I can keep going. So I choose to keep going because giving up is too boring. I was so glad she reached out because we have so many cases that are just like this. Mm-hmm. So-and-so was walking down the street, gunned down. So-and-so was standing with some friends, gunned down. They were driving, walking at a park. And they don't have answers. They don't have anything. And they feel disregarded because there isn't much to go on. They're not yeah. getting a lot of airtime. Yeah. And this could be anybody. This could be us waiting in line for brunch. Exactly. Like you, just, you don't know. And that was her point. She's like, you can be having a family picnic in a park and cr- and crossfires going through. Yeah. You know, Portland is becoming a place that we see in movies. You yeah. Know, like, yeah. It is scary. The The biggest takeaway is just if there's anyone that knows anything, because we have to get to a point that you're not being a snitch or you're not being cool about something or whatever by calling it in, because it's obviously somebody very dangerous, let alone the pain that it's causing this family. And that's not going to bring him back. And that's not going to take away the pain. Some sort of answer for why. Not that it'll ever make sense, but. I mean, I feel like it helps them, you know, turn the page of that chapter. Yeah, and... hopefully, hopefully. So um, if anyone knows anything about any of these cases, CrimestoppersOfOregon.com, it's anonymous, it's online, and there's usually uh, an, a reward, usually about 2500 bucks for most cases. So if that helps you, maybe, maybe I'll call it in. Murder in the Rain is a Cascade Media production, written and hosted by Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough, edited by Josh McCullough. You can always contact us at murderintherain at gmail.com or through our website, murderintherain.com. If you just can't get enough of Murder in the Rain, for as little as $5 a month, you'll have exclusive access to bonus episodes at patreon.com. You can find us on all of the socials, and for more true crime, follow at M underscore Murder in the Rain on TikTok, and you can also listen to Alicia and Josh on their other show, Always Be My Sisters. And suck my balls. <laughs> <laughs>